since I'm in Maine and I haven't been back in Maine for a while, I thought I'd wear my I'm a lumberjack shirt. <laughs> and it's okay. <laughs> Last time I spoke about the first book, which is really a system diagnostic view of the world. Uh, this time I'm going to briefly do that one, talk more about the second book which drills down to the level of nation states, gets more prescriptive. Not surprisingly, I sold many fewer copies of the second book. Because <laughs> people love diagnoses. What they don't love are prescriptions. I'm also going to give you a brief bit on something I'm working on now with Intera Solutions, my company, looking at how we get better at doing post-conflict, post-disaster, post-whatever situations. And I think we lost the sound. Start off with the idea of the new map. Give you a sense of where I locate that argument in history. Berlin Wall comes down 1989, seemingly everybody on the same rule set page. Francis Fukuyama, first guy out of the box, asks the essential post-Cold War question, which is, after ideology, what are we going to fight over? <clears throat> okay, very few people actually read this book because they couldn't get past the title. <laughs> if you did and got all the way to the end, his argument was it was going to be wars of the spirit or wars of identity. If you think about Juan's talk, it fits very well with what we've been seeing around the world. First guy to try to really answer that in my mind was my old professor at uh, Harvard, Sam Huntington. Sam, as he gets older, takes an increasingly darker view of human progress. His basic take on history is people got together, they learned how to make wars, they got organized into bigger groups, they got organized into bigger groups, so after the end of the Cold War, they just get organized into even bigger groups and have even more intractable conflicts sort of the grand march of human progress. <laughs> so he gave us a point to debate. That debate was joined, most famously, book that changed my life, Tom Friedman, Lexus and the Olive Tree. Okay, on that basis you can draw a line or define a spectrum. All righty. <laughs> Apparently I was leaning to the left there a little bit. And as I know now from Juan, that's okay, because I live in Indiana, and we're the perfectly balanced state. <laughs> okay, Friedman's take, shorthand, globalization. Some people get it, some don't. Very soon, everybody will be forced to. You should recognize this as essentially Marxism on steroids. Okay, and if you read the latest book, The World is Flat, he basically comes clean on that with the help of his psychotherapist, Michael Sandel from Harvard. I mean that in the best possible way. <laughs> Michael helped me work out many things. <laughs> Sam's view, again, very dark. Globalization, some people will never get it. Forget about it. They lack the democracy gene. They lack the market gene. Okay? What I try to do in my book is add the third leg to the stool, basically give you a plane. You're getting the economic determinism from Friedman. You're getting the social Darwinism from Sam. I'm giving you the political and military implications of that struggle. Okay? My take on globalization, some people get it, some people don't. Every, everybody's going to be forced to over time because globalization is an irresistible force. It can be stopped. It was stopped on the Berlin Wall for 50 years. When it expands, it tends to do so in spasms. But you can't add 3 billion new capitalists and then call this whole thing off because they haven't had stuff and now they got stuff and they want more stuff and it's not going to slow down. So this isn't about our choice. This is really the choice of those 3 billion new capitalists. And they've already voted. So here's the map we drew up originally for Esquire in March 2003. What you're looking at, about 150 times we sent U.S. forces abroad since the end of the Cold War. All I did was draw a line around 95% of it and asked what unites these regions. And my argument is what you're looking at there, that line, is basically the frontier of globalization as it envelops the world. I describe what's on the outside as the functioning core of globalization, basically the Old West, North America, Europe, Japan, plus the New East, the three billion new capitalists, plus key pillars from the South. Two-thirds of humanity, 90% of the global GDP, all of them increasingly synchronizing their internal rule set with the emerging global rule set, which I'll shorthand as free markets, free trade, collective security, transparency. I don't use the word democracy. 
Why? Most countries make this transition as single party states. Mexico did, basically. South Korea did. Japan did. China will for quite some time. So will Singapore. Countries usually have political control that's pretty strong as they make that opening up process work. What I call the middle is the non-integrating gap. No matter how you measure connectivity in the world, it is thinner inside that shape than outside. I think you can shrink the gap. I sometimes think that you're going to have to use military force to do so. The Balkans, we were told, were going to have intractable conflicts that lasted forever. I was in Dubrovnik, Croatia, sitting down with the prime ministers of all the successor countries. Okay? And as they went around the table, each one said, I'm going to be the best EU country ever. I'm going to be the most trusted member of NATO. The president of Albania got up and said, I want to make Albania the most attractive target for foreign direct investment in the world, Albania. Okay? So I think things can be solved over time. Doesn't mean this is a perfect place now. I've got a lot of work to do there. But it means you can get past the violence. Integration is possible. This is the mantra from the first book, Disconnectedness Defines Danger. No matter how you define it, Stability inside that red shape there since the end of the Cold War I can basically locate all the wars all the civil wars all the ethnic cleansing all the genocide All the mass rape as a tool of terror all the children lured or forced into combat activity all the UN peacekeeping missions all eight I count Iraq as three One good one bad one ugly US nation building missions All of it inside that shape 95% of the terrorism inside that shape People ask about the influence of these ideas. They say it's not a matter of influence, it's a matter of accuracy. Here's a typical presentation from the Office of Secretary of Defense. Familiar shape, they like to call it the arc of instability. Why? I guess it sells better. Here's the Canadian version. They're sort of the cool Americans. I like them better. They just call it the non-integrating gap. Why? When they looked around where they went for the last 16 years, it turned out they went where we went. Why? Because they go to the same failed states. Same problems. I think a grand strategy comes out of that picture. Here's three prongs. First, you've got to work across the core to mitigate and withstand problems like 9-11. I define a crisis as a vertical shock to a horizontally networked system. You've got to get better at handling that. Second, I think you will have to firewall the core off from the gap's worst exports, like pandemics, drugs, terror. We're watching this now with avian flu. But you're going to have to keep those borders open because you're going to age demographically across the core. Most of the babies are going to be born inside the gap. And you're going to have to shrink that gap over time because danger respects no borders. My argument is you need two different forces to do it. One force we already have, the first half force, the warfighter, the regime changer. That one I call the Leviathan, an unparalleled capacity to wage war and decide when other countries wage war. The second force we do not have. They're trying to build it in Leavenworth and Quantico. The second half force, the nation builder, the crisis responder, the humanitarian reliever. That force I dub the sysadmin force. Why? It's going to be more civilian than uniform. It's going to be more US government than DOD. It's going to be more private sector funded than public sector funded. It's going to be driven by events in the rest of the world more than what the United States can pull off unilaterally. These two different forces, two different functions. The Leviathan will work with traditional partners. They will all look suspiciously like the Brits in their former colonies. The sysadmin has to work with everybody. The Leviathan's all about jointness, military services cooperating. The sysadmin's all about interagency, okay? Which means today what jointness meant 16 years ago when I got into the defense business. Basically the t-shirt with the arrow saying, I'm with stupid. The Leviathan, in terms of personnel, I like them young, male, unmarried, slightly pissed off. <laughs> Which, if you think about it, you can almost see the poster, Uncle Sam, I want you to be a congressional page. <laughs> the sysadmin, I call it your mom's military. It's everything your dad's military lows and fears. It's going to be more gender balanced. It's going to be older. It's going to be more married going to be more children, more educated. Here's the problem. That's the force that's going to be more expeditionary. So your personnel problems got a lot more complex. You will see an aging out from left to right. How do I know? Check who works for private security firms today. So one force that takes down networks, 
Doesn't explain itself well. Another force that's going to have to put them back up and it's going to have to be tremendously open source. Okay? That's the first book in about three minutes. Moving on. Make an argument. <laughs> about the difference between war and peace. Think about the first half war, think about the second half peace. Here's the guy you're going to fight time and time again. Guess what? He doesn't want to take on your Leviathan force. For some reason he thinks it's an unfair fight. <laughs> this guy's going to go underground, often quite literally. He's going to wait until you beat the hell out of the situation. Declare our mission accomplished, pose for photos, <laughs> pose for photos in Vanity Fair, pass out the medals, write the memoirs. Then when you send in the B team, under equipped, under trained, under authorized, under funded, under manned, under the gun, he's going to go after him. And what he's going to try to do is kill two a day. That's all he has to do. And he'll throw unlimited labor at that problem. Either you disrupt the game plan or they're going to do it again and again. Who just got a taste? I think the Israelis did. <laughs> And I don't think they liked it. So understanding there's a scene between war and peace. Americans are very binary. I say in America, if you don't win the Super Bowl, you are a loser. The rest of the world doesn't look at it so yin and yang-like, okay? It's a little more cooperative. This is a bad question. We didn't lose the war in Iraq. We were running in about 35 days, 137 combat casualties. That was a brilliantly waged war. Basically, just cause on steroids. Okay? What we have been losing since is the peace. If you call that war, I guarantee you you're going to come up with more war answers, which usually involve more firepower, which is not going to get you anything you want. This guy was right about the footprint for war. People don't like to hear that. This guy, Army Chief of Staff then, Eric Shinseki, was right about the footprint for peace. People don't like to hear that. My argument is, we got a Department of War. And we got a Department of Peace. This is my bad cop. He gets stuck working the gap. He dreams of war with the core, specifically China, but he's stuck with the gap. Here's my good cop. Here's my good cop. Knows the core, doesn't know his ass from his elbow in the gap. Okay? Don't get me wrong, I love the bow tie crowd. <laughs> Them and 50,000 Marines and you got yourself a party. <laughs> Nobody's working the middle. We don't think about the middle. I go to plenty of war games on the left. I go to plenty of seminars on the right. What I don't go to are serious explorations how you get countries from left to right. Eventually I think we're going to have to create a bureaucratic center of gravity. Otherwise it's drive-by regime change from here on out. People won't pay for it with their sons and daughters with their wallets. Eventually we're going to have to create that bureaucratic center of gravity. I dub it. The Department of Everything Else. <laughs> Why? I'm not sure everything that's going to go into this department, but I do know this. If you're an American general in Iraq today and you say there is no military solution to this political problem, whether you like it or not, you're working for the Department of Everything Else. Because when you come back to defense, they say, I don't want to hear about it. And when you go to state, they say, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> Why we need this Department of Everything Else. There is a profound mission gap between the force we got and the force we don't got. Here's a description. In the Cold War, if we sent that Leviathan force out, it was big, huge footprint. If we had to do nation building on the far side, easy handoff, lots of boots on the ground. Paradigm, Normandy, June 1944. Heyday of civil affairs, whose motto is, secure the victory. Our problem today is a problem of success, not failure. That Leviathan is so lethal, so agile, so rapid, it can come and go before we launch the sysadmin effort. You want to talk about a lost year, there it is. About 2,200 combat casualties and counting. So here's the rule set we've got to adjust to. Wars have gotten shorter. The peace has gotten much longer. About 10 to 15 years by most people's definition. This has gotten a lot easier. There's nobody we can't whip. Traditionally echeloned opponents. This has gotten much harder. Much more complex. This is cheaper. We did the war for $130 billion. The peace is about $300 billion and counting. You can do this with a small footprint. To do this, you cannot escape the requirements for boots on the ground. Okay? There's this question we like to ask. Who sizes our force? In the Cold War, this force was sized, our Leviathan, by the Soviets. The question is, who's sizing our forces now? My answer is, the most advanced sysadmin force out there is Hamas. 
They are sizing our force if we're paying attention. So the Army's ambivalent about sysadmin. Go figure. They worry about losing their warfighting ethos, and yes, they know from reenlistment rates, which are high, people like doing this kind of stuff. So we're watching the Army in a historic shift from being the main war force, what it was across the 20th century, eclipsing the role of the Navy in the post-Cold War era and becoming the main peace force, the stabilizing force, the force that does not come home. How do I know? Check the money, supplementals, since 1990. You add them all up. This is how we actually pay for operations. Almost half a trillion dollars, 80% of it non-kinetic, as they say. 20% kinetic. 20% for war, 80% for the rest. The new counterinsurgency doctrine, Marines and Army, just dual designated, says successful counterinsurgency is 20% kinetic, 80% non-kinetic. That is a cry for help and a recognition that that's the history since 1990. So we're watching the Army go back to something we haven't seen in well over a century. You've got to go back to Dances with Wolves to find that sort of structure. <laughs> Cavalry regiments, three to 5,000 strong. They were rolled up into divisions for big war across the 20th century, 30,000 strong. Pete Schoomaker, current Army Chief of Staff, breaks them back down to brigade combat teams, three to 5,000. What does that tell you? So this sysadmin function will grow inside of DOD, but it will try to get rid of it over time. Why? The Defense Department hates this stuff. It'll be like watching Halliburton trying to get rid of Kellogg, Brown, and Root. It's not that KBR does not make money. It does. It's that it's a bitch politically. Make an argument for a larger rule set within which we contextualize the application of US military power. Okay, I'm going to make an argument, an analogy to economic bankruptcy. If you experience sovereign bankruptcy, you get turned over to the IMF. Russia got turned over in 97, 98. Argentina got turned over a couple years ago. We do not have a system for processing political bankruptcy inside the gap. How would I define political bankruptcy? Two forms. About one third of the countries inside the gap have too little government. They can't keep a leader on average four years. Two-thirds, almost, of the governments inside the gap can't get rid of a leader in less than eight years. Business hates both situations. So if I described an A to Z rule set for processing political bankruptcy inside the gap, I'd describe a front half where you better have military allies and a back half where you better have investors. Otherwise, you don't have an answer. Six-part system. We did it twice in the Balkans successfully, I would argue. We have three parts of the system pretty strong right now. First part is the UN Security Council's grand jury. What can they do? They can indict your ass. They can observe your bad behavior, write it on a piece of paper, have a vote, mail it to you, say in no uncertain terms, you better cut it out. <laughs> or else, say the John Joe Eid. Or else, says Kim Jong-il. Or else, said Milosevic across the 90s. Or else, says the UN, we're gonna talk about it some more. We're gonna send you a more strongly worded letter. <laughs> Downstream, we got the U.S. Enabled Leviathan Force, which says, in effect, I'll be happy to take that guy down for you. I'll do it on Tuesday. It'll cost you $23 billion. <laughs> but I got a big ball game this weekend, so I want to get home. <laughs> Way downstream, we got the International Criminal Court, which was set up for the gap, not the core. If you've got a functioning legal system, you're not subject, by and large, to the ICC. Yeah, you'll get nuisance suits now and then. But the ICC, what's so wonderful about it, it's a credentialed system for adjudicating and imprisoning bad actors. Okay? What they don't have is a system for getting any of them. What America has is a great system for getting them. We're great at it. But what we don't have is an internationally credentialed system for adjudicating them and imprisoning them. Instead, we have secret tribunals and secret camps. So you don't have to be a genius to figure out our peanut butter, their chocolate, comes together. <laughs> What we're missing in the system is a functioning executive to translate will into action. I posit the G20 in a growing role. What we're missing is a core enabled sysadmin force. There should have been 300,000 troops in Iraq post-war. Should have been 50,000 Russians, 50,000 Indians, 50,000 Chinese. Why? It's going to be Russia's oil industry eventually. It's going to be China and India's oil eventually. And we need to create some sort of standing international financial institution to finance this over time. Again, this is going to rise out of the G8. They're going to determine how you spend this money. What we're missing in this system right now, the black hole in our system, is the capacity to successfully reconnect countries post-conflict. That's what I call development in a box, the notion that we've got to get better at doing this. 
Why? Peace is the ultimate aftermarket. That's where people really make money. This is not about quagmires. This is about who makes the most markets in a flat world, Tom Friedman's phrase. Chinese already get this. We do not. So we're talking about the ultimate push package for post whatever. We should have had it for New Orleans. Frankly, after New Orleans, the people in Baghdad said, oh, now I get it. <laughs> it's what we should have had for Afghanistan. We did a slightly better job with the Tumblr. We did a slightly better job than that with Aceh and the tsunamis. What we're looking for is basically an ISO 9000 series analogy. Create standards, tell them what the standards are, and then give them the interface. Make it as easy as possible. Don't make them rewrite DOS. Just give them Microsoft Word. You know? First thing you do when you go into a country is you establish trust within that country. Why? You want to connect it to larger networks. You want to make that interface as interoperable as possible. You want to get them plugged in so they can play. Okay? We say, why not just standardize this process? We know what these are. If you're going to do the internet, it's going to be TCP IP. That's already been established. Just give it to them. Give them the whole damn package up front so you can get the private sector in there as fast as possible. And yes, exploit their cheap labor. Paying on average 50% higher wages than the local economy can provide. Africa would love such exploitation. How do you determine these standards? I say it's not hard. Just look at what investors like. Investors like Singapore. They like China. What do they like about these countries? They see a certain capacity already built in. There's a certain amount of infrastructure already there, but it's not totally built up. Bechtel could work in China for the next 50 years and never work anywhere else. Behind that, they like to see a certain amount of social well-being, which is why it's important to keep the peasants happy in China. Behind that, a certain amount of legal system. Doesn't have to be perfect. Business will come in when it's sloppy. They like coming in when it's sloppy because they make more profits that way. There's got to be a state behind that. There's got to be security under that. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs tipped on its side. Okay? We pretend if we just do one, maybe two, we're out of here. That's called the Powell Doctrine. We've got to get a lot smarter. We've got to make the entire journey. So it's about taking what we call traditionally less developed countries and then turning them magically into low-cost countries. What's the difference? I want to invest in a low-cost country. What low-cost countries do is they basically fill in the blanks just enough in terms of capacity building for foreign direct investment to take over. Then you're out of the business of official developmental aid. Okay, so how do you create this new minimum standard? We look at it as a four-part process. One, there are best practices for doing this across the dial. We do not make this effort in official developmental aid. Second, we should just give them the software and the hardware up front. It shouldn't be about who runs operations in our ports. We have the capacity to scan every container coming into a port. We should just give those computers, that software, that entire package to every country that does trade with America. Because our network is only as secure as every other network we connect to. So you're going to give them all the rules, too. Make it clear. Make it obvious. Some rules will be generic. A central bank is a central bank everywhere. Some will be specific. If you do Islamic banking, you've got to respect local tradition in that manner. And then you've got to give them the prepackaged training right up front. Turn this thing over to them as quickly as possible. Make it clear you're not staying. Quick argument about the Middle East. In the process of trying to connect the Middle East to the rest of the world. And it has not been well connected up to now. It's basically been about oil, nothing less. We have three key themes in this process. First, there's a tactical theme to the south. Al-Qaeda treats Sub-Saharan Africa as basically its Cambodia to that Vietnam. It's where it hides its guns, its money, its people, its gold, its training, its future. Which is why if we're successful in the Middle East, this fight will head south. Which is why you're going to have an Africa command very, very soon. Second operational scene relies to the north. We go on the offensive against transnational terrorism. What we do is create the same operational reach pattern we saw in the 70s and 80s. They can blow stuff up in the Middle East, and with some effort they can reach to Madrid, London, Beslan, Mumbai. What they can't do is come to America very easily. Third scene, strategic, lies to the east. What do I mean by that? Two-thirds of the oil that comes out of the Straits of Hormuz today goes east, not west. America takes about 15% of the oil. In 20 years, we're going to take about 15% of the oil. Asia will take about 80%. So it's basically their oil, our blood. And they know it. And they don't like to have that conversation. <laughs> Three key players in this instance. Iran is the avis of oil and gas. It has two new big friends, China and India. 
We are not going to successfully isolate Iran under any circumstances. In fact, Iran is the key to making stability come about in the Middle East. They can effectively veto our efforts throughout the region. They have reached for the bomb. Go figure. I walk up to a park bench, three guys sitting on a park bench. I shoot the guy on the right through the forehead. I double tap the guy on the left. In the meantime, the guy in the middle reaches for a weapon. I ask you, is he irrational? <laughs> or did I make that choice for him? Is Iran irrational? Can it be deterred? I think it's pretty clever. And I think we just got a demonstration of how clever they were and are in Lebanon. A preemptive strike, very deftly waged. All the reasons why Nixon wanted Iran as a regional security par uh, partner are still there. They are Persian, not Arab. They lead the Shia world, not the Sunni. And Al-Qaeda and the global jo uh, Salafi jihadist movement is exclusively Sunni. So I look at Iran and I see late Brezhnevian Soviet Union, a country ripe for the soft kill of connectivity. It's the one country in the region where the people like us. And it's the government that hates us. So thinking about the long-term solution set for the Middle East, let me lay it out for you. First, internally, demographics are going to go in our favor. The Middle East is going to middle age over the next 20 years. Okay? Huge youth bulge now, already stopped. So the Middle East middle ages over the next 25 years. I'm 44, I'll tell you, no jihadism for me in my future. <laughs> Three external blowbacks are going to be important. First, there's going to be a religious reformation led by women in North America and the Islamic community. It will be broadcast. Second, there's going to be a political reformation in Europe, the rise of Islamist parties. Stunning, I know, but there were Marxist parties in Europe during the Cold War. Get used to it. Third, the League Geese from Asia, where there are lots of Muslims who have roughly pluralistic systems and do just fine with markets. These are the long-term solution sets. Our goal in the Middle East the next 20 years is just not to screw it up. Can I go a little bit over? All right. But I really have to go to the bathroom for all that coffee. OK, I'm going to make an argument about the East, which I think is crucial here, really crucial. And I'm going to be honest about my bias here, OK? Here's a family photo. Okay, there's me, there's my wife, firstborn daughter, firstborn son, secondborn son. I don't know what the hell that is. <laughs> I thought she was going to be a sixth deduction. That was my whole theory behind adoption. No, but it is weird to wake up with a small Chinese woman in your bed every so often. <laughs> I say, who are you exactly? Okay, so I'm biased. I admit it. I'm biased. I'm a father of a Chinese-American family. And I guarantee you, I am. Every time I walk through Indiana with a Chinese daughter on my hip, whether I like it or not, I'm a father of a Chinese-American family. Okay, go back to the choice the Brits faced in the early 1900s. They could see their empire sun setting. They made a choice to align themselves with the rising power. Okay? They were smart. On that basis, they were allowed to fight above their weight for quite some time. <laughs> so here's the essential choice. We're Britain now, and what are we looking at? Are we looking at a rising version like America that can be tamed, or one that we have to fight inevitably, like Kaiser Germany? Okay? That's the question. I think it's clear that America's economic dominance has peaked. Why? The rest of the world's simply catching up. This is a very good thing. Militarily, we're still way out ahead. Nobody's even building our force, or even trying to build our force. Which shows actually a lot of trust in our system, which we're abusing right now. It's clear who the rising star is. It's China. My argument is, are we going to make the same smart choice with China? And are we going to fight above our weight? Because if we don't, it's going to cost us. That means we have to have a lot more cooperation with China. Here's the cool thing, though. They're the ultimate sysadmin, and we're the ultimate leviathan. We're willing to invade anywhere inside the gap. They're willing to invest anywhere inside the gap. Okay? We get these two together, we may actually find a principle between them. China's fascinating, but hard to figure out. Its rise does not need to lead to a zero-sum outcome for the United States. That's the argument from the Chinese. 
My argument is this is going to be the most important bilateral relationship in the world, the 21st century. You put China and the United States together, you cannot break globalization. You put them at odds, this whole thing can go down the toilet one morning. And Archduke Ferdinand lives in Taiwan. <laughs> so the theory of peacefully rising China is not a request, it's, a, it's not a promise, it's a request. Okay? Now we're stuck with the leadership we got on both sides. I like to say we know the who and when of China. Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao. If only we could figure out the what and the why. But we're stuck with the leadership on our side too, which is, you know, kind of cynically put a bunch of retreads from the Ford administration. The good news is they all have to go away in January 2009 on our side. And on their side, they're already electing and picking it's all insider done. The fifth generation of leadership. Why is that important? Third generation of leadership, Jiang Zemin went to Soviet Union for education. Fourth generation, current one we have now, did not travel abroad. That's why they're so cautious. They stayed home because it was a cultural revolution. Fifth generation went to school with me in America in the late 70s and early 80s. These guys are amazingly sophisticated and amazingly Kantian in their outlook. So big change is afoot. China's hard to figure out. Let me give you a hint about how big China is. What if we invited everybody in the Western Hemisphere to come live in America? Everybody. 900 million people. What if we invited all the Europeans to come live in America? 400 million people. That would be 1.3 billion people in America. Okay? But don't stop there. Ask them to live as much as possible on the coast. Okay? That's the United States as China. We're exactly the same geographic size. Nine and a half million square miles. China is like the football stadium just after the game. Everybody's a big crowd moving. Except it's like that in China 24-7, 365. China is hard to figure out because it is so spread across history right now. Depending on where you look, you can find the last 125 years of American history. Their foreign policy looks like us about the beginning of the 1900s. Their space program, it is so cute, I raised my glass of tang in salute. <laughs> They got a boom going on that's profound, like our 1920s. They're going to win the most gold medals in Beijing. 2008, watch the US Senate launch an immediate investigation. <laughs> they got a sexual revolution going on, mostly online. <laughs> they got a hell of a movie industry. They're post-industrial. They still like to break heads. Women are joining the labor force like crazy. Depending on where you look, you can find the last 125 years of American history. The best capture of Chinese capitalism today, mass media, it's called Deadwood. That's how rapacious it is. So China, in terms of revolution, simultaneously going on right now, profound. All sorts of things changing. And frankly, the one that nobody talks about much with China is actually the last one here. Demographically. China's going to age more rapidly than any country in human history. China and the United States should hit the Florida mark, 20% of their population over 65, roughly the same year, 2036. Except we will have taken over six decades to make that journey. China hasn't even begun the journey. Okay? So will they get rich before they get threatening, before they get old? I don't know. Which one do you think is going to be predetermined? So think about China as a series of balancing acts. Okay? It's the target for foreign direct investment in the world. Huge. It's got a trillion of U.S. reserves. It has one of the most opaque decision-making systems in the world. It's becoming a manufacturing superpower, and it's the country most likely to experience great power war with the United States. Never has one country presented so much promise or peril at once since the United States emerged in the early 20th century. So I say, lock in China today's prices. <laughs> Why? The price is only going to go up. They're not stupid. Opening price. Take off the table the open-ended defense guarantee on Taiwan. The notion that Taipei gets to declare war between the two most important pillars in the global economy is just this side a crazy town. <laughs> the Brits gave back Hong Kong. Now all contracts in China are written according to Hong Kong law. Who's changing more? The Portuguese gave back Macau. And that's a tremendous place to gamble. And I've got nothing else to say on that. <laughs> I'm saying if we don't get Taiwan off the table, you will continue to overfeed the Leviathan and starve the sysadmin. And that means Marines and Army soldiers are going to die every year between now and this mythical scenario. 
Why we want to get that on the table is because we need to deal with this guy. <laughs> this is a t truly totalitarian regime. No soft kill option available here. Very bad regime in terms of what it's willing to peddle around the planet. This guy is responsible for two million dead in his own country across the late 1990s with that famine, and now he's got the bomb. How much do you trust him? I don't trust him whatsoever. So we need China's buy-in. What for? Either they get rid of him quietly, <laughs> or they arrange for their friends inside North Korea to get rid of him quietly. Or we're going to end up doing something desperate, because this guy will pull a final straw eventually. We have to offer China something great on the far side to get the kind of trust we need from them to do this kind of thing for us. And what that trust needs to be built around is an East Asian NATO. We need this for the long war if we're going to shift resources to Southwest Asia and Africa over the next 10 to 20 to 30 years, which is where this fight is headed. Okay. Why it's important to understand this. Think about the partners we've had for the Leviathan over history. Okay? This is how we built the Leviathan. White men's club. The sysadmin will use a lot of these same players, but they're going to have to draw from the motivated ones, the ones really willing to fight and die and defend globalization, because they are expanding and getting richer in that process. It's like the people who are willing to go to the American West and settle it. Three key players in this process are going to be us, because we have the Leviathan force, but also China and India. Why? The two biggest body shops on the planet. And if sysadmin is a body problem, you've got to go to body shops. They're also the countries that are going to be located where the labor and the problem is going to be. With India, we're talking the Indian Ocean Rim. And with China, they are already all over Africa. So think about what we need to understand in terms of how we shrink this gap. We tend to price everything out according to American prices. The answer is, we get our hints from countries like India and China. What we need to shrink the gap is often cheap and simple and obvious and easier. If the Chinese had run the reconstruction of Iraq, I guarantee you it would have been finished on time. So when we talk about bringing Africa up to speed, understand this. Africa is going to be a knockoff of India. India is a knockoff of China. China is a knockoff of South Korea. South Korea is a knockoff of Singapore. Singapore is a knockoff of Japan. Japan is a knockoff of America. This is a positive evolution. We will not turn Africa into the United States. There are much simpler methods. One more point. I say if you were born before 1960, I'm not talking to you. I think you're too infected with Cold War thinking. You tend to assume if you're like us politically, you must be our friend. And if you're not like us politically, you must be our enemy. OK? That made sense in the Cold War. It doesn't make sense for people who were born after the Cold War. My emerging definition of who our true friends are in the world are countries that are most like us economically, not politically. So Don Rumsfeld has one view of China. That's what he grew up with. I got a different view of China, because this is what I grew up with. So let me challenge you with this one image here. In the future, the United States is going to have a lot more in common with China than Japan. Not a little bit, a lot more. We're going to have a lot more in common with India than the Brits. Not a little bit, a lot more. We're going to have more in common with those gangster capitalists in Russia than that 10 weeks of vacation crowd in Germany. <laughs> <clears throat> and after we co-opt the Iranians, we're going to have more in common with them than the French, which is actually pretty easy to imagine already. Pablo Picasso, the abstract painter, was asked to do a portrait of Gertrude Stein. Okay? This is what he gave her. She said, I don't like it. It doesn't look like me. His smart-ass reply was, relax, baby.